Former CIA officer and FBI special agent Tracy Walder is with us. She's been looking into the case. This is another really complicated case, right? Because there are some other deaths that we can talk about later, whether those will be included in these case, the former spouses of each of these people. But in terms of the kids and the murder charges, what type of evidence do prosecutors have? Well, thank you for having me, Morty. So, you know, they, they really have several things. Um, they have cell phone data, um, putting them in and around the scene of the crime. They have text messages. But the biggest problem that they have right now is that really most of the witnesses, as you mentioned before, are, are no longer with us. Um, we have Tammy, who has, you know, deceased really right around the time that the kids were reported missing. You have Alex, who also disappeared uh, right around the time that the kids were reported missing. And it looks to me like the defense is actually going to try to pin a lot of this actually on Alex Cox, um, who, who died about several weeks after um, the kids were reported missing. And so I find this to be very interesting um, to see how it's going to go. And really, the biggest interest to me is, is on the, the defense and what they're going to use. Right. It's going to be the someone else did it and they're not here to defend themselves uh, argument, right, in this case. The other situation you've got is Lori Vallow and her mental competency. Um, that has been called into question multiple times leading up to this trial. How do you expect that to be a factor? So you're absolutely right. You know, there's several different types of defenses that can be used. There's actually six textbook ones, and one of them is mental illness. But it looks like the defense is not going to use that. They don't want that, her mental health being brought in at trial. Um, and so what, like you said, that they're going to use before is that pinning it on someone else. And I think the reality is, is if she's convicted, um, her mental health status may be brought in at sentencing in terms of taking the death penalty off of the table. But it looks like they've been very clear and that they are not going to bring her mental health into the trial and it will not be playing a role in her defense. The other question that many may have as we start to learn more about what happened in this case and kind of remind ourselves and our viewers is you've got Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. Now their cases have been severed. They'll be tried differently. Will the question be which one of them, according to prosecutors, killed the kids or was it both of them? So I do think that that could be a question. Obviously, it would have been better to have the, it not severed, but she was unwilling to waive her right to a speedy trial. And really, Chad Daybell wanted more, his attorneys wanted more time to go through that evidence. And so they didn't really have a choice but to sever it. I don't know if they're going to play one off of the other. That could be good uh, for the prosecution in terms of deal cutting um, at this point. So, you know, I think it's, it's good and bad that they've decided to sever their case. I do think the prosecution and probably had a better case if they had decided to try the two of them together. But I, I'm not certain that they're going to pin it on each other. They seem rather united um, in pinning it on the person who is no longer with us, Alex Cox, as you mentioned, um, who committed this crime. Well, and we're on the heels of the Alec Murdoch murder trial, double murder trial in South Carolina, and the big lie in that case. Will the lie in this case uh, be the factor for the jury? Because you had Lori and Chad both lie about the whereabouts of the kids early on. They were missing, and then they went off to Hawaii. How big of a component will that be to the trial and for prosecutors? You know, Marnie, that is an excellent question and an excellent point. You know, I think in this case, that big lie that you mentioned, just in terms of lying about the whereabouts of their children, may not play as large of a factor. I think in the Murdoch case, as you mentioned, you had his voice on that Snapchat video, presumably four minutes before Maggie and Paul were killed. So I think that lie may play out a little bit differently here and that it's more circumstantial in nature rather than having, you know, their voice per se or a video of them per se. So I think it may play out a little bit differently, but I think that that's an excellent point. The other thing is seating a jury in this case. There has been a lot of publicity, certainly when it was happening and when the kids were missing and we were learning more about kind of the doomsday and cult-like aspects to this case. But a lot of time has passed. Do you think it will be as difficult now, a few years since the kids' bodies were found, to seat a jury who hasn't heard about this case? 
I do think that they're going to have a very hard time seating a jury jury that hasn't heard about this case. It's been about four ish years. And some of that was slowed down um, because of COVID, which is not necessarily anyone's fault. I think the issue here is you may not be able to seat a jury that has not heard of the case, but it's about finding a jury that's impartial. That's what's the most important thing here. So I think that's what's going to play out in the questioning of potential jurors the most. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.